Good morning. I'm back with uh, Andrew Garner. We're going to do some follow-up uh, questions and answers from the, the webinar, uh, Physical Destruction in a Digital Age. Uh, welcome back, Andrew. Glad to be here. Good to see you again, Ann. <laughs> All right. So we have a bunch of questions uh, that we didn't get to. So um, first question is, are you finding that people are just making are making just as many digital copies of files that used to be paper copies. So this is, I don't know how much you see this uh, with your your clients, but uh, you know, just the question of, are you seeing that sort of in your daily practice? Any thoughts on that? I am, I, I think people are making just as many. It's, mm -hmm. it's free to make digital copies. And I think it's an area of risk because you're making these copies um, and whether it's through email or through your internal infrastructure, there's just copies being generated mm -hmm. where in the past physical copies, one, there was a cost to that, although nominal, but uh, mm -hmm. yes, I'm seeing more and more, uh, I think the likelihood of making digital copies is just as great, if not greater than the physical mm -hmm. copies. Yeah, I think it's, I, that's that's been my personal experience too. I think people, it's easier to have, you know, your own, like a, a digital convenience copy uh, on your, your laptop and yeah. uh, you know, versus a stack of paper, uh, it's a little bit less visible, and it seems like it's de minimis, but it it really isn't. Um, we had a couple questions about sort of what happens to the boxes after uh, destruction. So let me just group those together. So someone says, "What happens to the banker boxes? The material is generally stored in. Are they shredded as well?" And someone notes that some organizations have content on the outside of their boxes that may be private. Uh, can boxes themselves be uh, securely destroyed as well as the contents uh, inside of the boxes? So I would caution then about what you're putting on the outside. Again, be careful with, with some of that, but, but a general question, Andrew, what happens to those boxes? Do you also shred those? Yeah, uh, we do, um, but not in totality. So I would say, that, not to get into the weeds, but it does depend on the shred system that's being run. Um, there's also uh, a contamination of the bale. So the bale that's generated and securely shipped to the recycler, um, if there's too much corrugate in that bale, it mm -hmm. will be rejected. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, there's no revenue for the recycler or for, for the shred company. So that's mm -hmm. part of it. But then that material has to be downgraded and shipped around. So there's additional cost. And, and mm -hmm. at, at times it, it it's very challenging and cannot be recycled and has to go for incineration or other purposes that mm -hmm. aren't as environmentally friendly. We review it, um, uh, the each box, so that the inventory we pull or if we're going off site and picking up boxes, um, our team members are trained. If there's any sort of uh, information on the outside of the box, uh, we destroy the box. Okay. But uh, the majority of the boxes we see are, are clean. They may have a barcode on it. They may have just a date range on it. Um, and those are compacted and recycled in a separate stream through our Corgit partner. Okay, but if you had special needs for a client, you would be able to handle those as well. In a Absolutely, stream. yeah. Yeah, we, we shred a lot of boxes. Yeah, certainly have the capability. So this one is, I think, a change management type question. Are, are as you mentioned, people in the organ, uh, as you mentioned, um, people in organizations change. How do you convince staff to get rid of records when retention is fulfilled, staff is very reluctant to dispose of records. I think we had a question that was similar to this one uh, during the webinar that we actually got to, and and I'll I'll take this one. I think that giving people clear guidelines, I think that that's what people run into the most. They're uncertain about the appropriateness of making uh, <clears throat> the disposition decision, and if you have a policy to point to and clear guidelines, uh, and they can understand what the records are, I think that it's it's easier. But again, that transition from one person to the next as people roll over in companies, I think is essential because I think that's one of the major issues I've run into is uh, yeah. people don't know what the records are. They're reluctant to make a decision on something they're not clear on uh, because they don't want to throw out something that that might be needed later. So any thoughts on that? Anything to add? Uh, no, I completely agree. I think it, it really is doing the front end work and having um, that retention schedule and then your organization having confidence in it. That's what I say. Mm -hmm. I always say that our customer lacks confidence in their, their retention schedule. And so it creates doubt mm -hmm. and then people within the organization start to 
really push back on approving destruction. They ask a lot of questions. They want to review. It just leads to a lot of other processes yeah. because they lack the confidence in that. I think that's where we, again, get to that sort of, <clears throat> that operations IG overlap is that this is, yeah. you can make it easier for people if those other pieces are shored up and people have, like, as you said, confidence in them. If they're, if they're solid and you can point to the, the policy very clearly allows us to destroy it under these circumstances and we have a process and this is the process I think that gives people confidence to make those decisions. Yeah. Um, we had a couple questions here too on uh, the certificates of destruction. Let me just ask them sort of together. So how easy is it to obtain a certificate of destruction for a job that was done in the past? Um, that might be difficult depending on who your vendor is. Uh, how long should CODs be retained? And um, is a file in an email enough for a certificate of destruction? Um, so I'll open that up to you. Yeah. To see if <laughs> so yeah, the certificate of destruction um, should be available for older destruction. So the vendor that provided that service mm -hmm. um, should have that of record. So you can mm -hmm. reach out and, and ask for that. Now, you know, obviously there's limitations if we're looking back 15, 20 years, maybe mm -hmm. that that vendors had multiple acquisitions. There's still a, a chance that things could be lost in mm -hmm. transition. But um, yeah, going back a year, a couple of years to provide a certificate of destruction should not be an issue. The uh, file, if I'm understanding that, if that's just the certificate of destruction is sent via email um, and attached, uh, that's appropriate, completely mm -hmm. fine. And you could store that digitally or or print a copy if you like. And the question, there was and one, there was one also, more question there. Oh, was that, yeah, how long should the, the certificates of destruction be maintained? And I would I would suggest looking to industry standards for that. So certainly some for yeah. medical records, a suggestion that you keep these permanently. Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure I, I have an answer for that. I'm, that's mm -hmm. a good question. How long to keep a certificate of destruction? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would look for your industry standards and that there's certainly yeah. industry guidelines on that. Um, so the next group we have is some questions around uh, COVID. Are there new COVID standards for safe handling of documents? And then what measures are being taken to enable and facilitate on-site manual reviews of hard copy records in the current environment of COVID-19? Yeah, so definitely COVID changed the way we, we process um, our file deliveries, um, our box pickups, our box deliveries. So, First is, you know, as everyone is doing, just PPE is everywhere. Um, sanitization standards mm -hmm. uh, is at the forefront of everything we're doing. Um, I think probably the biggest change for us process-wise, besides adding those two elements, was we have a lot more scan-on-demand delivery. So we're we're... Um, setting that up for a lot of clients and instead of delivering that file, um, we're doing the scanning and then electronically pushing that over to the client. So there is no handling, there is no interaction with a transportation specialist. It's all done electronically. And, and we saw that because we had to adjust some of our routing mm -hmm. uh, for that very reason. Businesses were closed, we're not open, but we need these records. So we've had a big spike in our digital delivery and converting that hard copy file and pushing it through. So that's probably been the biggest change for us. And it's, I think it's something that will continue because now we've put the processes in place. The clients mm -hmm. love it. They're, a lot of times we'll deliver a file and then the client's simply scanning that. So now we're doing mm -hmm. that on the front end, pushing it to them. And uh, so I think it's a, a, a trend that's been in place, but COVID really Push pushed it forward. It. Right. Yeah. So we have a bunch of questions here that I think fall into that sort of the IG kind of space. Do you recommend mm -hmm. um, destroying records strictly by your records retention schedule without approvals from business unit stakeholders, or is it best practice to receive approvals from users uh, of the of the records? I my I, I I'll yeah. let you take Get it first, approvals. but I, I I have yeah <laughs> I have some strong feeling yeah right I think a, I think an approval process is 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 appropriate usually so. I would yeah. be disinclined to do it just by um, a retention schedule um, because, and, and I think oh. it, it always deserves a, a good legal review too, to make yeah. sure that there's no litigation that's occurring and a legal hold that should be in place for those records. So, yeah. And, and I think that approval is much easier once again, everyone has confidence in that retention schedule that it's a much quicker review 
and uh, the approvals come more easily. Uh, there's another one. One roadblock to shredding is deciding what's archival. Do we have any recommend, uh, recommendations or descriptions of, of rec records that can be archival or are worth keeping? I think that's a that's a very organization specific question. Yeah. I think there's some some things that are, are common across organizations, some foundational documents and things like that, but you need to make that determination for your organization. I agree. Yeah. Um, can you ever destroy old records like 20 plus years without an inventory or must uh, they be inventoried? Uh, you know, we, we were talking about this one. I again, I think it's it's um, you know, what's your confidence about what's what's in that box, right? So, uh, you know, like I, I could go upstairs and, you know, shred my mom's uh, like file cabinet full of of records from, you know, 20 plus years ago because I, I have some reasonable confidence of what's in there based on the labeling and stuff like that. Um, you know, I don't have a full index of those documents, but, you know, I think it depends on what it is and your confidence level of that. So, I don't, do you have anything, you know, I'm sure you encounter clients who, who run into this all the time. Yeah, um, I, think it, it, I think it's industry specific. I think it's also knowing uh, what kind of, if you have descriptive data, have a sense for that. If you don't have anything and you're just going off 20 years, then I would just be cautious that you, um, you know, understand the, the retention for your industry and perhaps everything is met. You know that you don't have critical, you know, historical documents mm -hmm. stored, uh, then you may be safe moving forward. But I would, I would always err on pulling a few, looking at the inventory, maybe not mm -hmm. every box, but if you have a, you know, again, it depends on, I think, the industry and what kind of data you might have for a sample of that. Inventory. Right, and I, I think sampling is is the idea there too. You know, it's it's what's your what's your level of confidence of what's what's in that box without digging through it and doing mm -hmm. a, a full index, and then also, um, you know, industry standards too. Yeah. So, um, what inf what information should be included on a box inventory to avoid having to recall and inspect the box? Um, thoughts on that? <laughs> Enough. Um, I, I keep saying sort of industry specific, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, I, I, I like to see and recommend that there be a, a, a description. So a general description of what's in the box. Mm -hmm. um, then depending on that, um, it might be uh, from and to date ranges, whether it's batch work, whether it's uh, uh, accounting files. So you have some general date range, obviously a destruction date so you can put that in based on your retention schedule. Uh, but yeah, I think it gets a little industry specific, but to and from ranges and then just a general description of what's in the box. You know, if it's medical records, uh, I like to see every file listed in, in, that, in, that, in that contents of the box um, uh, or at least chart numbers. So it just depends on what they're running, but you want to, at the end of the day, you want to be able to step back and review it and know that not only yourself, but someone else 10 years from now will be able to look at that and understand exactly what's in there. So if you and take I, I think, that yeah, it's enough point, to make the determination, right? So, correct. and that's going to depend on the nature of, of the record itself, how much detail you're going to need. So, you know, Anne's, sure. Anne's, uh, Anne's cat pictures probably doesn't need right. a whole lot more than that. <laughs> There, there are yeah. files that, that are ants cat pictures, by the way. Um, so how would you address, I think this is related, how would you address orphaned and abandoned records? So this is a common problem as, as personnel change over. Yeah, it's, it's very much a common problem in our world. So I'm speaking of abandoned records that uh, are in our, the offsite vendor space. Uh, we have a very defined process and that process is, um, you know, notifying the client through certified mail of, of the last known address we have and running a publication uh, in the local paper um, stating that as of this date, um, you know, these records will be retrieved and destroyed. Please contact us if you need it uh, to access these records. But before that, it goes through, again, depending on the industry, it goes through our legal review team to determine mm -hmm. if it's eligible for our abandoned inventory process. So, um, I would say get a legal set of eyes on that and then proceed accordingly. 
Mm-hmm. And I think I think this is probably you know, it, I mean I think that's you're you're looking at it from abandoned at, at your facility. I think people are thinking about abandoned records too within their um, within their organization. Again, this is the same problem as the the turnover issue. You know, determining you know what what it is. How how old is this record? Who was the last person? At some point, you're going to have to address it. You you know, very often people will continue to kick the can down the road, uh, yeah. but that doesn't that doesn't uh, address the issue. Um, so I, again, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to take, take those things head on, but again, it's gonna have to be in the order of priorities of your organization. So if you have you know, a, a bunch of abandoned records that may not be first and foremost on people's agenda, but if you can start showing how much that's costing the organization, talk to them about risk, uh, maybe you can start you know, eating into that inventory mm-hmm. and then use that also as an example of, you know, just if you're incurring a lot of costs associated with that, an example of, you know, why we need good inventory on the records and why we need to track them better. Um, let's see. So sometimes people um, uh, go overboard with a shred everything philosophy. How do you prevent employees from putting binder clips, uh, file folders, magazines, blank paper, uh, packaging paper that comes with printing paper, newspapers, etc., cetera, uh, in shred bins? And I think this is just a um, yeah, training issue, but yeah, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. It's like, um, I think we were also well, talking about people putting PPE and other things like that in the recycle bin or the, yeah. so it's the same, same kind of problem. Things belong in, in, this is the making people make the decision. This is sort of going the opposite direction saying, don't make a decision, but we don't want people to be, um, crazy about it. And, uh, you know, not, you know, put, put packing paper in there. That doesn't make any sense. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, so everything that was listed um, that I heard you say, including binder clips and magazine packaging paper, all of that is completely accepted. I mean, you can put it in the bin, right? So if you want to take a, the strongest possible stance of shred everything, that material can go through and be shredded uh, just fine. Um, I would say like, if you have a lot of newspapers and mm-hmm. you have a lot of magazines, mm-hmm. um, then, Again, sort of going back to, I think on our, our the webinar, we talked about, you know, book manufacturing, you know, a publisher who has a lot of a specific mm-hmm. type of paper that we know is not confidential, then perhaps you, you that's where you go with a recycling bin. But I would always say, I think most offices, is, there's no problem throwing in two or three magazines into a shred bin just mm-hmm. to maintain that, that strict policy of shred everything. Mm-hmm. But again, it's, it's, you would have to, if there's an issue that you have just an abundance of them for some, some reason, then you might want to think, think differently right. about it. Right. And I, I would say really for us, what we see is food waste is a no. Um, PPE, any bio has, you know, when we put bins in medical, inevitably we'll see everything from sharks to um, tissue samples. And it, so that's, that's where we step in and say, wait a minute. This mm-hmm. is this is not the intended use for this destruction bin, um, but if it's paper, paper clips, binders, even three ring binders, um, that stuff goes through fine. So the next one is how do or how does the records manager sign off on shred that they haven't seen? And this seems like one the situation where someone needs to witness the shred for some reason. Yeah, um, it sounds like that. The person who asked that question is clearly witnessing and, and getting on site shred service, which, which is fine. Um, mm-hmm. if, if your organization requires that, then, then you would need to, you're perfectly in compliance to have that material sent off site and destroyed. And then you provide a certificate of destruction. Um, so Uh, work order that the material is getting picked up. So mm-hmm. there is a signature captured for to time date stamp that the material is picked up. But uh, yeah, no issue with with the uh, co- from a compliance standpoint. Mm-hmm. I think though, if you, if you have a if you have a requirement within your organization to witness it, then you know then that's then that's that's a, sure. a reason for the yeah. onsite. So. Um, so after scanning in original signature documents, should paper documents be saved offsite as well? Um, this is a 
you know, it's a common question, like, can we, after we've done a digitization, can we get rid of the, the, the physical documents? And that, that's, again, a question that you have to answer within your, your organization and your industry and the specific types of documents, I think. So we just actually had a, um, an article published on our website about this topic. It's an 80 country survey addressing this issue. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a question of, do you have an obligation to keep that original document for some reason, either you know, your uh, like a legal or regulatory requirement or just even a business reason to keep it is my my thought on that. Do you have anything to add? No, I would agree. I would agree with everything you said on that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's hey, see. Ed, let me, sure. are you hearing me? Are you hearing me fine? I am, am I coming yes. through I'm, well? Yes, okay, you are. Okay. You, you cut out for a, a little second okay. there. But um, right. okay, so I was getting notifications. I was going to change networks. Go ahead. Let's see. So I have found the actual guidelines for planning to digitize and digitizing fairly straightforward. My concern is around creating an inventory of records or assessing an organization for the volume of records and determining priority of digitization. Uh, any advice on how to engage an organization to to assist in this assessment or inventory? Yeah. If, well, if you do business with Access, I'd say give us a call and uh, it feels like that's information governance. So I kind of mm -hmm. setting up the, the framework and, you know, the processes for your information flow and prioritizing what should be digitized first. But uh, um, yeah, I would I would start there and, and then just internally what's most critical and what's touched most often, what would mm -hmm. benefit from being digitized. And I, I actually worked on a, a project like this with a client. It was um, the question, the, what, what got digitized was what was being recalled all the time. So those were the records. So that was, right. you know, so it was sort of a rolling, rolling digitization project. So the records that were being recalled uh, on a regular basis where they were incurring the cost of calling documents back and forth. Um, those are the ones that were digitized first, and then they sort of expanded uh, the scope of it. So I think there certainly is a rational way to do it. And, uh, you know, start a good starting place is what are you, what are you looking at? On, or what are you recalling each, you know, more, more regularly? Um, let's see. Yeah, and it kind of ties what we talked about earlier with, with the COVID and scan on demand. So we've really seen a, a, an increase in what would have been normal file deliveries are now um, the instructions provided to us are we want to scan it, have it electronically delivered, then we have a set retention schedule. It may be five to 10 days, and then we destroy it. Okay. So, so um, just a question here. What is the, what are efficient, op what efficient options exist when records have not been indexed in a way that supports whether those records may be relevant to a legal hold or litigation matter? Uh, it is logistically a challenge to send physical records to an employee's home to perform manual review of box contents and indexing data is insufficient to make a determination. Well, so, you know, I, yeah. that's the rub, right? Uh, so this is why you need to have, you know, good indexing to begin with and understand what's in your boxes before you send them off site. Um, if you can't make that determination, there, I, there's not a super efficient way to do it unless you have, do you have any other suggestions, Andrew? No, and it almost sounds like when, the person asking with at home, it almost sounds like kind of a COVID dilemma as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say, you know, pre or you know, post COVID, um, an on site review. So mm -hmm. pulling a large chunk of that inventory to review at, at the vendor site, you know, not mm -hmm. have to send someone off site, uh, send one of your team members off site to review it. Or, you know, most of the people in the RIM business are pretty familiar with most industries, types of records, they can talk enough for the language. And so it's not uncommon for businesses to reach out to us or, or any room vendor and say, here's the specs that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Can you look in these files and make this determination for us and capture that uh, information in a spreadsheet, send it to us. So, and you know, we, we provide that service, particularly during COVID where you don't want to send people off site, you don't want to require people to interact, then, you know, that is something your rent provider can provide as a review of that inventory for you. Well, I, I, I certainly for inventory, but if it's a, an assessment of the, the relevance 
to the le le legal matter, that might be a, a, a separate matter, or you'd certainly have to look at that index. Um, yeah, that's getting so, a little more detailed than you'd want to trust with us. <laughs> so, and then... Um, but I was thinking more just a bit, like inventory that's there. You're right, so asking, sorry, uh, having, the, having the vendor... Inventory that's there, you having don't the vendor know what's inventory. in the box. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, Correct. that I understand. I understand the, how you're bounding that. Um, so, uh, with any shredding approach, uh, and only with sorry. Um, okay, so this was this was a little confusing. I wasn't 100 percent sure the person was asking. Um, with any shredding approach and only having shred events scheduled monthly, perhaps there's a risk uh, with the holding time between deposit and actual. I think deposit in the shred bin. Um, and the actual shredding place. Am I responsible to know what bin something is in if a legal hold comes up? So I, I guess this is a, a theoretical from my perspective. So I don't know how that's a long, uh, you know, if you're if you're waiting a really, really long time, it's possible that you put something in the bin and a legal hold has come in place before, but, you know, you, you're required to, you know, keep things when when litigation is anticipated, not just when the hold is issued. So um, I think this is a really unusual situation. The likelihood of its occurring seems yeah. seems rare. Um, but any thoughts on this? Yeah, I certainly wouldn't go. I mean, they do, do seem that that situation seems very rare. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't evoke some process to track what material you're putting into each of your bins. Um, yeah, sure. I would say if there's ever something that's in a bin and you're like, wow, we shouldn't have put that in the bin. Right, you still have, it doesn't, it doesn't. That destruction company can come and unlock those bins. Right, so yes, so, yeah. so if you. So it's not, uh, you could potentially uh, retrieve mm -hmm. uh, documents from that bin by contacting that provider. Next one is uh, sort of any suggestions on where a Nigerian firm can purchase bins for shredding services. So um, it was suggested to me that the Institute of Information Management, IIA, uh, sorry, IIM in Africa might be a place to look for that. So I don't have any specific suggestions other than to reach out to them, um, unless you have any thoughts on that, Andrew. Uh, yeah, can't help much uh, outside of North America. Okay. Are you finding more companies are becoming more comfortable with having their content shredded offsite versus onsite? Do you have particular industries, departments uh, that mandate onsite shred? And if so, which industries? Um, definitely seeing businesses getting much more comfortable with offsite. That's definitely a trend that both clients and vendors are moving towards. Um, industries, not particularly. I uh, can't think, you know, there's certainly highly confidential government entities that require even going back to, you know, that I think on the first call we talked about almost sand like particle size mm -hmm. destruction, you know, to that kind of granularity. Um, but no, no, I, I do see the trend going to offsite clearly. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple here on sort of the post shred process. What happens to those big bales of, of shredded uh, paper? So once the documents, I'll just read a, a, them and we'll address them together. So once the documents have been shredded, what happens uh, to, to it uh, from that point? Uh, what what happens to those pallets of shredded paper? Is it recycled? We, I think we did answer that on the call. Uh, what happens to those bales? Any of it burned? Uh, do you sell your shredded uh, paper for recycling who to and then does the third party buying the shredded paper sign a confidential agreement with with access or a, the offsite vendor so yeah, kind of so, what, what's happening to those bales i think so we've we've shredded everything down to a particulate size now what and it, this correct. sort of foreshadows so a question we have later too yeah yeah the material uh paper shredded to the nate specs it's bailed and uh, then shipped through uh, to, to specific recyclers, right? So we, mm -hmm. we do have agreements in place um, with those recyclers because then they're taking that material and, and pulping it to make other products. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the pallets, I think they're probably just referencing bales. So you know, yes. it's the, the, bale, the shredded material isn't going into big open Gaylords where it's just loose, fluffy paper. Um, it's being compacted into bales and, and shipped to recycling mills. 
Um, but then that, that is a secure, you know, those trailers are sealed, they're tracked all the way till it's pulled. Okay. And that's a, that's a requirement of the NAID. So continue, so this, I think that's the um, question is sort of there's continued security until the final pulp. That's right, correct. Yes, there is. And then, and then we are, the, the shred business that ships that paper is paid um, for the, uh, the fiber value of that. And, you know, that, that fiber value fluctuates mm -hmm. considerably. It's a pretty volatile market, particularly right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it is uh, a revenue stream for all shredding businesses on the back end. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a couple questions around the shredding at home. So what are shred bags? How is this different than a, a normal bag? Uh, and then the questions of, is it okay to dispose of stuff that's shredded into the regular trash? And again, I think some of that would, some of that, the what you can dispose of would be, would depend. Um, but can you just talk a little bit about these shred yeah, bags? The so I mentioned the shred bags. That's something that that we at Access have been uh, rolling out, and we do it. Um, you know, we gave it some thought when COVID came up because it's certainly a need. Mm -hmm. Was uh, we like the uniformity and the consistency of the packaging of those documents, mm -hmm. so that operationally it flows through our processes very easily and uh, provides the client. Uh, a receptacle. Um, mm -hmm. If we, you know, there are businesses and if you go online, you can Google search and find them pretty quickly that you can uh, ship them any box, but then you're shipping that material via some third party to a destruction center. Mm -hmm. um, there's companies that'll come pick it up at your house. So there's other options um, and, and you have to find one that you're comfortable with. I mentioned shred bags because for our existing shred customers that are now have a displaced workforce, that was a solution for them to be able to aggregate that material back at their, mm -hmm. their home office for us to pick up on that shred scheduled shreds get uh, stop. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's one on, on the time to complete the actual destruction. So uh, it says once the offsite storage company has been notified to destroy a number of boxes, how much time should it take before they completed the destruction? We've had a lag of up to two months. <clears throat> That's a great question. That's a really, I mean, and it's something I hadn't thought about, but we get a, lo a lot of questions around this. So um, I always like to give information and not just kind of give a gray answer. So typically speaking, and a lot of this depends on labor, right? So we're, me we're managing our labor and retrieving boxes and shredding boxes is incredibly labor intensive. Mm -hmm. So for for us to ramp up considerably is overtime or adding team members. Mm -hmm. So we try to balance that um, and keep obviously enough to do daily work and a little more. So I would mm -hmm. say, uh, generally speaking, whether it's a large record center, or small record center, 50 boxes a day, which is roughly a thousand boxes a month is kind mm -hmm. of the minimum. Like mm -hmm. that, that's, that's sort of the floor. Mm -hmm. And if your vendor is saying, you know, that's all we can pull, then, um, there's probably some, some, I would, you know, I could support that because I understand the, the challenge. Now, all of that's negotiable. I would also say if you, um, well, first and foremost, I'd say have a regularly scheduled destruction occurring, whether it's quarterly or monthly or at bare minimum annually. So you don't have these large chunks of inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times what the clients are frustrated with is they want 4,000 boxes pulled and destroyed and then 4,000 boxes removed from their storage in, invoice. So they don't, they don't want to pay for it. They've signed off on it, right. but it takes time and it is incredibly labor intensive mm -hmm. to pull boxes and destroy them. So, um, but all of that can be worked out. I would, if the takeaway, I'd say a thousand boxes a month, your vendor should be able to provide that. That's mm -hmm. sort of the floor. Mm -hmm. And then um, anything above that is, is, really probably more site by site, facility, okay. facility, labor, um, and how efficiently they can get that material pulled and processed. Mm -hmm. I was I was wondering uh, if they meant here, so it's noti notified to destroy a number. I was reading this differently, like the, they've already pulled the documents. So you're, so there, there certainly are, are once, once it, the documents have been pulled, there are tight standards on how quickly it has to be destroyed. But then I think this. Oh, this, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is. I think you. I think you read this correctly. That it was a question of once I've notified them, how long should it take? I think you. I think you read it correctly. I was reading it um, in a different in a different direction. 
Yeah, um, if, if, when it's signed off, um, mm-hmm. it's usually a, it's usually something in the contract, but typically mm-hmm. within 30 days, um, that material should be getting pulled and processed. Mm-hmm. Should be destroyed now, um, but it does go sort of depending on the records agreement contract you might have. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I was reading it as if a lot of times uh, the records vendor is, um, you know, the clients are pushing back. They're frustrated because, you know, we, we got 5,000 boxes and we're saying, hey, it may take us four to mm-hmm. five months to pull this. And um, mm-hmm. they're frustrated. So, I was talking I, about the need, the need, the need standards, the need standards from from receipt to destruction, though, are pretty tight. Yeah, and the, the NAID standard for us with the with the inventory off the shelf is is looked at or viewed different a little differently. So it's when it's retrieved. Okay. So the, the actual service date isn't the signature. It's actually when we retrieve it off the shelf. So okay. It's Understood. a little different than if we come on site and pick up shred bins. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we had a couple questions around the types of shredding. Uh, so does the type of shredding depend on the on how confidential the material is? And then does it cost, is it more expensive to request cross shredding, for example? And then there were a bunch of questions around the IRS standards uh, versus the NAID particle size and, and if you could address those generally. Yeah, um, depending on the, the, the vendor and the shred system they have, and I would ask them for cross cut. I mean, if, they, if, if you uh, won't cross cut, then find a vendor that provides that tour their facility and make sure that you're seeing the output that you desire. Mm-hmm. Um, Shred companies with different types of equipment can again um, shred material down to one millimeter. Mm-hmm. You know, literally, the like think of a ten or eight font <laughs> uh, letter S. That type of granularity. Um, I, I don't think that's necessary, but there are certain applications, particularly governmental applications, where that's required. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the material, yeah, it's. We shred to NAID standards. Um, and so if there's things outside that go above and beyond NAID, you need to be aware of those mm-hmm. uh, and seek out and make sure that you communicate this is the type of uh, um, shred size that we require. With mm-hmm. the IRS, uh, you know, all of the material, I believe if we shred it to NAID standards and then we securely have it sent and tracked to the pulp process, Mm-hmm. Uh, then you're meeting those standards. Um, I, I, I think one of the questions had mentioned like two millimeter to five millimeter shred mm-hmm. size. And there's going to be very few companies that are going to provide that. Your, mm-hmm. The majority of your shred companies are not going to set their equipment up to run that kind of uh, particle size. Or if they do, it's going to be incredibly expensive because it mm-hmm. takes a lot of time to shred down to that size. Uh, but most will shred to the NAID specs and then securely track it to the pulping process. Some companies may do incineration, but most are pulping. And that, uh, you know, I think, checks that box. But you can look back through that IRS regulation. Okay. Well, I think we're at time. And I think we, we got through uh, all of the, the questions, the remaining questions. Andrew, thank you so much for your additional time today to go through this. So thank you everyone for attending our webinar, Physical Destruction in the Digital Age, and uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ann. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.